My dear cousin, the firm cannot advance over five cents a pound against your wool until there is more chance of finding a customer for it. I still hope that you will devise some means of putting off your purchase of this ranch, but believe me, you are making a grand and grave mistake. Even your friend Rawson, no matter how much you may feel for him, could hardly expect you to buy a property like the Nigel Ranch when there is so little likelihood of your being able to make it pay. When Lewis Moulton was 10 years old, his parents separated, and Lewis went with his mother to Boston to be near to her family, the Fennos. Boston had a population of 350,000, nearly half that of the entire state of California. Its major industries were dry goods, nautical supplies, metalworking, and publishing. The Fennos were well established in the city on the hill as bankers, wool brokers, and publishers of the Weekly Wool Report the Financial Times of Textiles. Lewis's first job was at a farm called Green Harbor. Subsequently, he ran errands for a storekeeper, earning a dollar and a half a day, about average for unskilled labor. His future here looked bright, but for Lewis, neither a desk job nor a sure thing ever held much appeal. At the age of 20, he boarded a steamer headed west. The five-week trip through the Isthmus of Panama landed him at Wilmington Harbor from whence he took a stage to Santa Ana, arriving at midnight. The next day, Lewis found work shepherding on Rancho San Joaquin, today known as the Irvine Ranch. Southern California was a wild and wide open place. Crossing Rancho San Joaquin by horse took half a day. Grizzly bears wandered free. Over time, Lewis bought a flock of sheep and eventually secured the lease on Nigel Ranch from its hard luck owner, Cyrus Rawson, one of his close friends. Lewis was confident he could make money in wool because of his family connections back in Boston. All he needed was an opportunity. Friends called Cyrus Rawson, owner of Nigel Ranch, the kindest man who ever lived, but he wasn't the shrewdest businessman. Struck with a combination of bad luck, bad timing, and feckless speculation, he stayed afloat by borrowing money from just about anyone including the Fennos. As Rawson drowned in interest payments, the nation's second longest recession hammered the economy. With no options left, Rawson put Nigel Ranch up for sale. Lewis offered to buy it for $125,000, a steep price for grazing land in the middle of nowhere. Lewis would have to borrow the money from the Fennos to make it work. There was only one problem. Lawrence Fenno disapproved of the purchase. I am so much of the opinion that you are doing a rash thing. If you take my advice, you will put the matter right before Mr. Rawson and explain to him that you do not see how it would be possible to consummate the deal for the ranch on a basis of $125,000. Nor do I feel you are willing to admit the gravity of the situation which the present outlook presents. We are just at the beginning of the failures, which will be the natural outcome of the inflation which has been going on for the past 10 years. It will be more than a shame if you put your head in the noose when you've been advised beforehand of the results. Lewis may have been motivated by friendship as much as anything. He signed the deal without Lawrence Fenno's backing and presented his cousin with a done deal. You did tell me when I was in Los Angeles that you had come to some understanding with Mr. Rawson, but you certainly never did tell me outright that you had closed the trade with him. If it was anybody but you, oh, how quickly I would say, wind up the business, pay me out, and take your own course. But blood is stronger than water, and I am certainly in a quandary as to how I should act. Now you say, and say rightly, that I should want no kinsman of mine to break his word. And if you've definitely agreed with Mr. Rawson to this transaction, I cannot say any more. Without getting their permission, Lewis had just agreed to borrow money from the Fennos so that Cyrus Rawson could pay off the Fennos and other creditors with that same money. Just after Lewis inked the deal, the rain stopped falling. Drought. The price of wool dropped by half. The grass was short, the creeks dry. One by one, and then by the hundreds, lambs began to die. Lewis took a desperate gamble, divide his sheep into four bands, and drive them into the Sierra Nevada mountains. Their path ran through one of the most brutal places on Earth, the Mojave Desert. Sand, rattlesnakes, and blistering heat for weeks on end. 12,000 sheep on the move. Lewis hired the French Basque Jean-Pierre Daguerre, 
to oversee one of the bands. They drove the animals a few miles each day and drew them close to the wagon at night. Very dear companion, I would like to let you know that the desert is very dry. There isn't anything. On the way here, we had a lot of work and a lot of misery as far as water and meadow. The animals are quite hurt. I have lost some. Everyone was searching for feed. Tens of thousands of sheep had made the mountains ahead of them, and more desperate shepherds appeared every day. Cyrus Rawson, former owner of Miguel Ranch and Lewis's dear friend, had agreed to help. Awaiting in the town of Bishop, Rawson wrote, Four bands in such a season is awful to contemplate. It has been as dry as powder here this winter, and no spring rains at all, so the brush cannot grow much, and that is the mainstay in the mountains. Everything is piling upon us at once, distressful times and distressful seasons. One might wrestle with either one alone, but the two together almost break one down. And yet, there is no use in whimpering. We will give our troubles the most manful battle we can. The drought had no equal for 125 years. Lewis missed an interest payment. He tried to sell all his animals, but no one was buying. One prospect returned half the animals because they were too malnourished. After having warned Lewis over and over not to purchase Nigel Ranch, Lawrence again proved his unfailing loyalty. Rather than selling the wool at rock bottom prices, he stored it in Boston warehouses and loaned Lewis money against future income. I should not as yet give up all hope of the sheep business. If a good many of the itinerant Frenchmen are run out of the business in your neighborhood by the low prices of wool, maybe just so much better for you. A long-term perspective is well and good, but a business without money is like a chuck wagon without food. At Lawrence's urging, Lewis took on a partner. He sold a third interest in the ranch to his foreman, Jean-Pierre de Guerre. Jean-Pierre had come to California the same year as Lewis, in 1874. While Lewis's travel took five weeks, the trip from France likely took six months. Once here, Jean-Pierre did what his French Basque ancestors had done for centuries, shepherding. The partnership was a natural. Lawrence Fenno's prediction came true. When enough shepherds went out of business, the price of wool stabilized, then rose. They managed to sell the old inventory at acceptable prices. With Jean-Pierre as a partner, Nigel Ranch could weather the next crisis with confidence. In fact, within a year, they purchased several thousand more acres. The ranch continued expanding until the Moulton Fenno cousins could look back upon the years with a wisdom born of hardship. My dear cousin, from my own personal experience, I have long since discovered that the best way to get a good substantial property is first of all to have a legitimate business. Know it thoroughly and work it for all it is worth as I did in the wool business and as you have done on your ranch. In times of panic, the people who blow loud horns and skate on thin ice generally come to grief. Take my advice, old man, and invest your surplus income from the ranch in the best things going. They pay a little less, but they pay it regularly. And if I can help you in making your selections, do not fail to call upon me. Lewis married a school teacher, Miss Nellie Gale, and they had two daughters. 30 years later, Lewis passed away, at which time the women took over. But that is another story.